everyone. Hello, everyone, um, and good morning to those in South Africa and good afternoon to those in Singapore. My name is Alden and I'm from the Singapore Business Federation. We are pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Developing the Technology Nexus Between Singapore and South Africa, Gauteng. Here are some housekeeping matters. By default, you have joined the webinar in audio only mode. If you have any questions at any point in time of the webinar, please type it into the question and answer panel. In the interest of time, they will be answered virtually, or you can save it for the speakers when you connect with them at the virtual business roundtable session. That will be happening immediately after the webinar ends. So please stick with us after the webinar has ended to join us for that session. The program lineup is as follows. Now, I would like to share a clip on Global Connect at SBF, an initiative set up to assist Singapore enterprises which are looking to internationalize for the first time, as well as enterprises which are expanding. May we have the video, please? Global Connect at SBF helps Singapore businesses expand into overseas markets. Since November 2019, we have guided Singapore businesses as they seize business opportunities in Asia and beyond. From identifying emerging trends to closing deals, we provide a full spectrum of overseas business expansion services. With Global Connect and SBF, you can learn about new markets, customers and free trade agreements across the globe land opportunities and scale up in new markets, both physically and digitally. Localize overseas operations to ensure sustainable long-term success. Our Singapore enterprise centers in Indonesia and Vietnam also provide on-the-ground business and market development services. We also provide a dedicated digital B2B marketplace to quickly scale your business overseas. With Global Connect B2B, Set up your company profile in minutes and start contacting thousands of regional partners and customers. Last year, Global Connect at SBF reached out to over 2,000 companies, completing many overseas expansion projects through its network of trusted business specialists and professionals. In 2021, Global Connect at SBF will also launch new initiatives for Singapore businesses to position themselves on the international stage. Explore business opportunities across ASEAN, South Asia, Japan and other markets by joining us at Festival, our flagship digital event. Become part of the Global Connect at SBF community today and start enjoying exclusive benefits. Customized business advice, access to our overseas Singapore enterprise centers, preferential rates for services, as well as structured training, one-on-one -on -one advisory and assistance on using free trade agreements to extract greater commercial advantages abroad. Global Connect at SBF, connecting your business to global opportunities. In summary, with Global Connect at SBF, Singapore businesses can learn with us about new markets, new customers, and free trade agreements. Learn with us through our dedicated digital spaces, established networks, and hands-on advice and facilitation, and localize with us through our trusted relationships abroad to deepen your presence and secure your long-term sustainability. So please scan the QR code on the screen to visit our Global Connect at SBF for more, web, for more details. The Professional Conversion Program for Internationalization Professionals supports enterprises to recruit and train experienced individuals for their internationalization plan. 
It also aims to, to develop a core pool of local talents who are ready to assist enterprises expanding into different regions, such as Southeast Asia, China, Africa, Middle East, uh, and South Asia. On top of this, the PCPI also developed a B2B e-commerce track to support enterprises that use e-commerce platforms for their overseas expansion. To find out more, please scan the QR code or alternatively, you may reach out to AD or Elizabeth via the emails on the screen. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to invite Ms. Mosa Chabalala, Group CEO of Gauteng Growth and Development Agency to give her opening address. Ms. Chabalala, please. Good morning and welcome everybody to this very exciting initiative between the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency and Implementing Agency under the Department of Economic Development in the province of Gauteng, South Africa, the economic hub of not only South Africa, but of the continent um, broadly. Our relationship with SBF started, uh, I'd say close to 12 months ago, and we sought out the relationship as a GGDA for the very reason we're here today, to ensure that from a South African perspective, we create opportunities for businesses in South Africa to find exposure and to enable them to create opportunities for expansion into not only Singapore, but really Singapore as a gateway to Southeast Asia. The topic we chose as our initial kickoff and introduction to the market for the two entities is around ICT and digital services. Of course, this would be the most natural um, conversation between the two countries because what COVID has taught us is our inability to use technology as an underpinning driver to ensure that we continue to successfully trade between ourselves as countries um, will mean that we actually as businesses will not be able to survive the world of not just tomorrow, but of today. The opportunity that I hope the businesses in today's session take up is to ensure that you really absorb the knowledge and the expertise that the panel is going to be sharing with you, all the speakers that are here today. But not only that, use the B2B opportunity that is then created as the second half of today's session to ensure that you reach across the ocean between the two countries, you engage, you understand how, how you are as businesses operating in this new normal and thriving in this new, new normal and how you can potentially collaborate in creating partnerships and sharing not just your services, but your expertise, your technology, and any other advantageous factors that you may find between each other. I'm really excited about our collaboration with, um, uh, with SBF because it opens the door for South African businesses to understand Southeast Asia, but to understand specifically Singapore's business environment. And it does the same for Singapore-based businesses, to understand South Africa's economic environment, to understand the business opportunities, to also understand how to land softly as an investor into South Africa. Extended to that though, from a GGDA perspective, we not only create opportunities for you to identify investments in South Africa and uh, opportunities for your businesses to grow in South Africa, but we are also able to do so across the continent because our focus as a Gauteng Growth and Development Agency is not just to create B2B opportunities for South African companies, but to also use South Africa and use Gauteng as a gateway to the rest of the continent. We really invite you to reach out to us at our different um, points of connection at the GGDA to explore further how you can collaborate, how you can find opportunities and how we can support you from an investment, promotion, attraction, and facilitation perspective. Today, you'll also hear from one of our subsidiaries in the GGDA, the Innovation Hub. And the purpose of the Innovation Hub is to attract, identify, incubate, and support businesses in the science and technology sectors so that they may continue to find the solutions and to develop further opportunities using ICT and technology to support trade and investment 
for uh, you underpinned by technology. Please enjoy today's session. Please reach out not just to SPF, but to GGDA as well. And we invite the, the conversations to continue beyond today. I welcome you all and enjoy the session. Thank you, Alden. Thank you, Ms. Chabalala. Now I am pleased to invite Mrs. Busi Mate, CEO of RRS Innovation to give her presentation. Ms. Mate, Mrs. Mate, please. Thank you, Eldon. Um, welcome, everybody. So for the next 10 minutes, all I'll be doing is literally just sharing with you the overview of the IT sector in South Africa, the expected growth trends. And I think what's equally important is that the regulatory environment in South Africa. If you go on to the next slide, I mean, there's a number of studies that have been published recently. And the one that I just picked are two uh, publications from the IDC that I think most of us are aware of and the International Trade Administration. And in these studies, there's actually an interesting fact around South Africa being the largest ICT market in Africa. And in recent years, the three services that have really pushed this are mobile software, security software, electro and electronic banking services. And ICT is actually one of the largest contributors to our GDP. So if you look to the right, um, Stats SA released a publication showing our growth rate in the in Q2, which is from April to June, 2021. And you'll see transport and communication we, where ICT falls and has been the, the biggest contributor to our GDP growth, which has grown by 1.2%. But over and above that, and I think um, Musa spoke to it, that South Africa is actually a gateway to the rest of Africa. And this has become evident by the number of technology and software vendors that have started setting up house in South Africa, building infrastructure like um, cloud services infrastructure and building um, data centers around South Africa to support the rest of the continent. But what the IDC saw in last year was that the IT spending declined by 10.2%. And I think we're all aware um, the impact that COVID has had on, on us all, and especially in South Africa. But equally, on the flip side, there is expected or anticipated growth of 5.2%, which equates to 12.78 billion that's expected in South Africa from an IT spend uh, perspective. So it shows that there is really growth in the ICT sector that's expected um, in the South African market. If we go on to the next slide, I thought I'd just give you a flavor of who are how the spending looks like or how the spending used to look like. So public sector used to be the biggest spender until last year um, from an IT perspective. Um, and from a public sector, there's one entity that really looks after all the ICT of the public sector and they, um, they, they distribute that um, accordingly. Um, but what, what the big focus from a public sector uh, perspective and spending I think it's to, to the, there's few key interventions, but the two I just wanna pick on is to increase the usage of ICT. And what's important is to facilitate socioeconomic justice and economic inclusion, because the more people have access to technology, the better they could uh, either trade or access services that they could have never accessed before. And equally so it's with the fourth industrial revolution, um, being here, it's actually not coming, it's here already. And I think COVID has, has kind of catapulted that to happen quickly, is to improve South Africa's competitiveness and preparedness to deal with the fourth industrial revolution, given how we were behind with the rest of the, uh, the industrial revolutions that, that took place. And the government has really created a lot of initiatives. And I think um, um, Musa spoke to one of those initiatives being around <clears throat> the innovation hub that you'll hear about later. There's a skills development program where the government is wanting to, to train about 1 million, million young people by 2020 in ICT support services. So your robot, robotics, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, networking to make sure that they're ready to embrace the fourth industrial revolution, but also to help us address a high unemployment rate. There's also an initiative around 
SMME development strategy that, that the aim is to actually accelerate the growth and development of the SMME sector, especially around ICT, so that they also are able to play in this fourth industrial revolution. The last one that I just want to share with you is just the um, 4 IR um, commission that is very close to the president's heart. And this is to make sure that as South Africa, we take advantage of the opportunities being brought by the digital industry revolution. From a private sector perspective, in the last few years and now, I think the largest spenders we've seen has been the banking and financial institutions. The rest of the sectors are still, or industries are still coming along, but from a banking and financial institution, we've seen a great spend from an ICT perspective. And we suspect that this is going to grow in the next 10 years as more people actually enter the formal market. Um, if you think of the SMMEs that would go through the acceleration program I've spoken to, they need to get into the banking and financial institutions. So we see more tech being developed in that. And the biggest growth um, really now is around um, retail banking, where we've seen them spending a lot of um, money on digital transformation and increasing their online security measure. And this is really driven by trying to be innovate, innovative. There's a lot of innovation that's happening <clears throat> across South Africa from an ICT perspective, and that's around internet banking, um, mobile access, and one that's really starting to, to really pick up, which um, has started in some of the African countries is mobile money solutions, where people that are not able to bank, how do you get them to be bankable if they don't have access to the banking environment? So how do you start using your mobile to actually drive um, the, the banking um, sector. If we move on to the next slide, what I just wanted to share with you then based on where we are as a country is where do we see ourselves going based on some studies and trend analysis that um, some consulting companies have done. So this, this growth trends and opportunity is from a publication that um, was done by Deloitte towards end of last year, and the, it was a digital disruption index, and it was mainly based on um, South African companies. So what they did, they interviewed a number of executives in charge or responsible for digital technology in both the private and the public sector. And in this publication, um, majority of the executives mentioned that the reason they have started or they'll continue to digitally transform is for customer experience. So that there has been a rise around how do you ensure that you look after your customers and how do you give them the experience that is unique to them using the technology or the data that you have to do this. And the function that's been mostly impacted or affected by this is a sales and marketing uh, function. So what was interesting was that as at end of last year, 67% of those executives that were being interviewed mentioned that they have already invested in cloud. And they were saying by 2021, 90% of them expected to have fully invested in cloud. So we're seeing a rise in cloud adoption, in cloud, um, in, in moving, from um, on-prem to cloud or some sort of a hybrid model between cloud and on-prem. And what's also interesting is that 61% of them actually said the organization has starting, are starting to deploy cybersecurity technologies. And I think you'll, you'll appreciate that this has become very important given the number of cyber attacks that, that has taken place and has actually gone even higher due to the COVID impact. And if you go onto the right-hand side of the graph, um, the question was then asked, so, so where would you be spending your money in the next 12 months to 24 months? So if you look ahead, where do you believe you're going to be? And there's three technologies that most of these executives have actually said they're going to be spending money on in the next 12 to 24 months. So that's cloud, and I think that's important with um, people working from home, with companies trying to consolidate 
and look and look at to where they need to be to go from here. And data analytics has become even more, more important because companies are now realizing they have so much data, they want to give customers a unique experience. So by investing in data analytics tools, they'll be able to reach their number one goal. Cybersecurity, as mentioned, is the third one that they're actually looking to spend money on. But I think if you, what's even more interesting for me um, is, I mean, there's a number of them. There's, um, there's wearables, there's biometrics, there's blockchain. But if you look at artificial intelligence, um, I think that's going to be what is actually regarded as one of the critical technologies in the near future. So for the next 24 months, companies will start getting ready to invest in artificial intelligence um, because I think they're looking at technologies that allow them to have deeper real-time insights. So there's, I mean, conversations with I'm having now with most of my clients or most of the customers is how can I use the data I have to get real-time insights to make better decisions? So no longer is it about looking at historical data, that's important, but how do I use the data I have now to inform my business strategy, which will ultimately inf inform my digital strategy? So those are the type of technologies that we're seeing in South Africa really gain traction. And I think most of you would appreciate that if you think about cloud data analytics and cybersecurity, those are actually the technologies that kind of pave the path for implementation of other technologies. So once you have cloud, then you can decide around all the rest of the ones at the bottom. Once you have data analytics tech tools, then you can plug in the rest of the technologies at the bottom. Or once you have your cybersecurity technologies that is embedded in, in, in your digital transformation, then you're able to decide which of these different technology biometrics blockchain do you want to bring in into, into your organizations. And having said that, I think what's equally important, if you go on to the next slide, is um, we often asked, um, you know, how safe is, 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 is my data in South Africa? So if I were to invest in, in your country, do you have any legislation that actually supports or will ensure that from a legislative perspective, um, our data is going to be safe, or if anything happens where I've invested in, we would have adequate um, regulation that will ensure that from, from a perpetrator's perspective, everything is dealt with, and from a business perspective, the understanding is there. So, I mean, I'm going to start with the, the top right one, and um, that's a legislation that has been in place since 2002, and that's the Electronic Communication and Transaction Act, and this was really set up then um, to define, develop, and regulate and govern the e-commerce in South Africa. So that's a, one of the, the regulations that as, as you use e-commerce, you need to ensure that you, you comply with. And moving on to, the, to, to one that has become effective end of last year and companies were given a year to comply with is on the top left, which is the Protection of Personal Information Act. So that's our data legislation um, act. And, and the, the, this act, is actually not stifling business uh, uh, people from doing business. What it's actually doing is just putting together concepts and regulations to ensure that when data is transferred between different organizations, either in the country or outside the country, there's certain conditions that you need to comply with. And it's very strict around what those conditions are and secondly, if there's a transgression, how the transgression is dealt with. On the bottom right, um, bottom left hand uh, one is the Cyber Crimes Act. This is an uh, act that has really taken a long journey. It was a Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act. And the Cyber Security Act is still in draft. Um, the Cyber Crimes Act has been signed by, by the president May of this year and we're just waiting for the effective date to, to take place. And this is the one that puts us um, on, on equal footing. I would say cybercrime and the Protection of Personal Information Act puts, that, puts South Africa on good footing um, because we are now with the rest of the global um, community that have those legislations 
and that will help us to ensure that data information flowing between different countries is protected. So the Cyber Crimes Act is literally around how do you, what they define what cyber crime is and, and how do you deal with um, uh, people, organizations that have committed a cyber crime and what the what those organizations need to do as soon as they suspect the, there's a criminal um, a thing that's taking place. On the left, on the bottom right hand, is, is one that is fairly new to South Africa, and I think it will support what you've heard to date that I've been talking about, is the draft national data and cloud policy in South Africa. As I've mentioned, data is becoming important. Cloud, we're seeing lots of companies moving on to cloud. So this is really an, a, a piece of legislation, a second, sorry, a, a draft bill, it's not yet legislation, that um, is seeking to ensure that uh, from a South African perspective, we actually strengthen our capacity from a cloud so that when, when cloud providers either come into the country to offer cloud, there's a regulations around that. When organizations move on to cloud, there's a regulation that, that encompasses what that means. So I think what's important to, to note is that from a South African perspective, there is a big growth um, around investment in, in, in different technology, either from a governmental perspective or from a private sector perspective. But what, for me, what's encouraging, having been in the space for so long, is that our regulation is really coming to party to ensure that we become a country that investors can look into and know that there is opportunities, there are growth opportunities, there is opportunity to invest, but equally so, there's regulations that will ensure that my investment is kept safe. Thank you, over to you, Alden. Thank you, Mrs. Mate. Now I'm pleased to invite Mr. Lim Kuitia, partner for Baker Television to give his presentation. Mr. Lim, please. Hi, a very good morning as well as afternoon to everyone. So in the next couple of minutes, I'll be covering a little bit on some of the overviews in Singapore and a little bit of comparison with South Africa as well. Next. So the three things that I'll be covering today, I'll be covering a little bit on what Baker TV does on the high level, followed by an overview of both the digital ecosystem and growth trends within the area, followed by what are some of the opportunities we can explore in both Singapore as well as South Africa. Next. So Baker TV is an international firm. We focus on the advisory audit as well as assurance. We have about 700 of our offices globally present both in Africa as well as Singapore and looking very much in the areas of audit uh, governance of the likes. Next. And over here at Baker Television, we have joint venture focused a lot in the areas of technology, specifically in future tech, focused in the area of AI, blockchain, and cybersecurity. And we're looking at very much on how to help companies digitize themselves. Next. So over the course of the next few slides, I'm covering a little bit on the digital ecosystem and overview between Singapore as well as South Africa. And if we look at a comparison between Singapore and South Africa, South Africa has approximately about 10 times the population size of Singapore itself. And in areas of connectivity, we're able to see that Singapore from a broadband based perspective or landline uh, basis, we are almost 100% connected versus South Africa that's not as high, but from a mobile connectivity basis, in terms of percentage, majority of the people within South Africa itself is highly mobile connected. So if you will see that in terms of the trends, both continually are increasing in terms of number of users, except for Singapore in terms of mobile connections, we have dropped a little bit since last year, Primarily maybe because of COVID, when more people started working from home, they might not need that many mobile connections or a number of foreigners going back to their home countries. Next. And if you look from a platform basis, um, looking just very much at the Apple store as well as the Android store, looking over the course of the last 30 days, what would be some of the key so-called applications that the majority of the people are downloading? And if we look very much at Singapore, a lot of the trends in terms of downloads has been focused very much around e-commerce and more recently, a number of government applications that has been introduced uh, in areas of our trace together to be able to do contact tracing, 
as well as some of the other amenities that the government's providing to Singapore, and as well as social media. And very much similarly in South Africa, social media is one of the top downloads over the last 30 days, followed by communication tools and followed by transportation. Next. So if we deep dive a little bit into an overview of Singapore and what are some of the key directions that the government is trending towards over the next number of years. On the top left graph, you're gonna see that Singapore has a key milestone drive for strategic national projects driven into a few key pillars. One pillar is focused on national digital identity. And what this really means is looking at how every single citizen as well as person in Singapore can be basically identified where all the other different fringe items and services that he will be using within the country would be revolving around the identity. And we've since rolled out in Singapore what we term as our SingPass mobile token. And in addition to that, as a next layer, we're focusing in the areas of e-payments. So today in Singapore, we're able to make payments quite a lot in majority of the places using one of the national payment infrastructure called PayNow, where you're able to scan a QR code and have almost instantaneous transactions being made up to about 200,000 uh, per day per, per person. Followed by payments, one of the key drives, it's very much in areas of smart city, smart nation. And one of the things that Singapore is working on, it's very much look at how are they able to aggregate a lot of the different city infrastructure and put IoT devices and machine-to-machine -machine technology inside so that we're able to automate a lot of other so-called infrastructure within the city itself, followed by urban mobility, as well as moments of life. Moments of life is basically capturing some of the different key moments within the society itself. And all these key teams are driven very much into three core sectors of focusing and looking at digital economy, digital government, as well as digital society. So one of the key drives that we can see that is trending very, very strongly in Singapore, it's very much an uptake in the areas of e-commerce. If we look at from a regional perspective, uh, Singapore ranks actually globally one of the top three in terms of growth in e-commerce in the year 2020, ranking at number three from a global scale. And some of the top popular platforms you will see in Singapore on the bottom right side would be like Shopee, Lazada, Q10, Amazon. And one of the fastest growth you can see just between Q1 2021 towards Q2 is Shopee that has grown tremendously by more than 80% comparatively, comparatively to the rest of them. Next. So if you look at South Africa itself, and on the bottom left side, you'll be able to see that looking at the number of platforms that has grown from between 2018 to 2019, a large number of them has been very much in the technology space. The first one being online shopping that has grown tremendously from 67 platforms to more than 98, followed by the freelancing, the e-hailing, the logistics courier, and so on and so forth. The technology-focused so-called platforms being very much one of the fastest um, areas of growth, yet at the same time, if you look at in terms of ranking, we can see that e-commerce is still ranked very, very much way behind at rank number 38 in terms of number of app store downloads. What we can see from here is there's still a lot of growth in some of the areas such as e-commerce or e-commerce related items in Africa itself. And from a mobile cellular growth rate as well as number of active so-called uh, subscriptions, it's very much in terms of density, very much higher than the world average itself. So with many fragmented platforms, the key thing still is that there probably might be some eventual consolidation down the road as so-called more of these platforms become more mature and become stronger within the space itself. So still a lot of tremendous areas of growth from e-commerce, payments, logistics, manufacturing, and free services around it. Next. So jumping a little bit into some of the trends in Singapore itself. So one of the things that has been a key trend that has been moving over the last number of years itself is that there's a huge movement of many large technology-based enterprises to use Singapore as a regional hub and a base very much expand towards the region. So we're able to see large companies like Tencent that runs uh, the, one of the largest successful apps in China called WeChat, followed by uh, TikTok, which is ran by ByteDance, Big O Life, 
as well as uh, Zoom, which you're all using right now as well, Twitter, Rakuten, and more, many of them are actually setting up in Singapore as a regional hub to expand throughout the region. And one few key reasons for this, it's very much looking at the digital infrastructure that Singapore has, continually investing into digital connectivity, as well as the talent base and pool that is continually invested in by the Singapore government to ensure from infrastructure level, from a talent base level, from a connectivity level, we're always one of few key leading parties and countries within the region to be able to expand into. Next. So as we can see that as much as e-commerce has been growing significantly in Singapore, this trend has not actually been that long very much in Singapore. We see that Amazon Prime has just set up in Singapore since 2017 with 100,000 square feet facility. Lazada has been around for one of the oldest that's been around since close to 10 years ago in 2011. And Shopee, which is the market leader right now, has just very much started in 2015. And majority of them use Singapore as a base very much before they grow and outreach towards the rest of the region itself. Next. So some of the key initiatives in Singapore, Singapore being a very strong base that very much look into foreign direct investments, um, very friendly taxation, very much looking at highly professional and quick so-called turnaround from a professional services standpoint for company setups and the likes is very much a core region and hub that can be used to expand to the rest of the region itself focusing very much in establishing core infrastructure, a talent pool, as well as driving heavily on technology. So for companies who wish to come to the rest and expand towards the rest of the region, for reaching out to ASEAN region or China of the likes, Singapore will be a very good base with the good talent pool, as well as professional talent pool that's highly advanced in technology space as well. Next. Very much friends in Africa, I think that's very huge amounts of growth and of growth opportunities with double digit growth in almost all different sectors, whether it's from supply chain or in areas of e-commerce or manufacturing or even from a financial sector itself. So very much looking into the space itself would be something that's interesting to explore with high and opportune growth opportunities. Next. So summing up some of the opportunities that we can look at very much at Singapore or even at South Africa from a Singapore basis to set up as a core hub to reach out as a gateway to the rest of ASEAN as well as China with the right talent pool infrastructure and continued investment in technology with highly favorable taxation policies would be a good hub to utilize as an area that you can expand to the rest of space and very much from South Africa from a connectivity and resources as well as high growth opportunities will be good opportunity as well. So definitely looking forward to see what we can do in these two key areas. Next. For companies who wish to expand into Singapore from a Baker Tilly standpoint, we do cover from an end-to-end -end basis all the way from company setup to taxation to audit to accounting and professional services. And on the second hand, also looking at how we are able to assist in areas of advisory, business digitization and using technology as a core to be able to grow your business. Next. Next. So if there is any so-called people that would like to connect or just find out about what Singapore landscape might be, you might be able to reach out to us at hello at bakertelevision.co or you can search me on LinkedIn at Hui Jie Lim uh, on LinkedIn itself. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Lim. Now I'm pleased to invite Mr. Peter Hall, CEO of the Innovation Hub, to give his presentation. Mr. Ho, please. Uh, Mr. Ho, you are muted. Thank you very much, Program Director, and, and thank you very much for the presentations um, by the three uh, speakers. Um, the presentation will will be made by my colleague on the C-Web, but I thought it's important that I just give a background on the Innovation Hub. Now, the Innovation Hub in, in Gauteng, in our province or in our state, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency, the GGDA, where Musa Tsabalala, who's the group CEO, gave the keynote address. And it was established by our provincial government 
um, as an innovation agency of this province and state. And its mandate is to promote socioeconomic development and competitiveness of the, this specific province or state through innovation. And the Innovation Hub acts as a direct contributor to enhance the economic growth and global competitiveness of Gauteng through innovation and knowledge economy. So the three focus areas that we are looking into through our incubation program is the smart industries, which we call the digital economy. There we focus on ICT and advanced manufacturing. And I see that the, some of the previous speakers already alluded to 4IR. Then we also focus on the bioeconomy, which um, specifically um, zooms in into health and agro processing, especially now with the COVID pandemic. We have a company that has developed a COVID-19 uh, um, solution and a COVID-19 detector. And then obviously in the green economy, which is our third sector, we focus on energy, water, and waste. So those are the key focus areas. And I thought, let me just give a background on, on our program. And then I'll hand over to one to see where just to do the presentation. Thank you, uh, program director. Thank you, Mr. Hall. So um, now we'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Mahaya, Ms. Mahaya, sorry, to, to give her presentation on the Innovation Hub. Thank you so much, Alden. Um, and thank you, Advocate Hall. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so my focus today will be on smart industries. Um, some may know it as the digital economy. So as the smart industries unit, we focus more on innovation and business incubation. Next slide, please. On the innovation side, we have uh, uh, two programs, the demand-led open IX exchange program that focuses mainly on delivering uh, tangible solutions to real-time challenges um, posted by problem seekers, whether from government or private sector. And then we have our annual competition, which is a uh, Houting Accelerator program, which focuses more on innovators, researchers um, that are looking to uh, um, uh, introduce their novel technologies um, that will improve uh, government efficiency and also enhance the quality of um, ordinary uh, citizens. Next slide, please. So on the, on the next slides, I will be focusing more on the incubation program. Um, uh, just uh, a brief on our smart industry side. So we focus more on startups um, and uh, startups that are on, in ICT and advanced manufacturing with a strong focus on the um, internet of thing types of solutions. Um, so our key objectives is to promote skills development that will be focused more on industry 4.0. Uh, we establish and manage innovation uh, collaborations uh, with our stakeholders in different platforms. Uh, we also recruit and support high growth and high impact technologies. Next slide, please. So um, I will be speaking now about our business incubation program. So we have um, a, an umbrella program, which is called the Maxim program, but underneath it, we have the Maxim Digital and Maxim Smart. So under um, Maxim Smart, next slide, please. Excelsmart relates more in ICT, uh, but it focuses more on um, IoT related solutions with aspects of big data, analytics, devices, sensors, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. Um, under Excelsmart, we also focus on advanced manufacturing. So relating to primarily industrial IoT and advanced manufacturing as it relates to 4IR. Um, and then we would have our Maxim Digital Program. That program has a strong focus on the creative industries, more along the lines of gaming, animation, virtual reality, and augmented reality. So in our incubation program, startups have two phases. They have a 12-month um, pre-commercialization phase. Um, and then we have a three-year core incubation program. The purpose of the, the core program is to upscale and also create market access opportunities and to ensure that 
uh, companies are sustainable. And then after that, we would graduate them after six months uh, with positive cash flow or healthy pipeline for um, more clients. Uh, so during the incubation program, startups have access to the following interventions, which would be business advisory, more especially around the lines of mentorship. Um, as uh, Busi said, um, we have challenges around skills development in the space, so we focus on that as well. We provide operational space, which is the infrastructure for the startups to work. We also provide funding opportunities um, and create market access opportunities and networking um, opportunities with our partners. Next slide, please. So on this slide, um, we just have uh, different clutters in the incubator, but among the different clutters in our incubator, the largest one, as you can see, is the software clutter, which constitutes about 54% of the total um, incubated companies. And the reason behind it, um, according to us, is mainly because it's more around youth um, um, entrepreneurs and it's more around uh, software. So most probably uh, the skills that are needed in that sector, I mean, sector are more accessible uh, currently in South Africa and also the uh, absorption to, to the industry. Um, is easier. So that is why that is popular. And then um, the most solutions that are, are in, the, in the cluster are digital platforms, mobile applications addressing a number of issues in the industry, government or community. So um, next slide, please. Towards the end of my presentation, I will then provide some examples of, of, of companies in the different uh, clusters. So Maxim has been operational for more than six years, but in the six years um, that Maxim has, has been operational, we have spent over 10,000 plus hours of mentorship with our entrepreneurs um, in internal support. We've, we've also spent over 30 million um, on seed funding, uh, which in excess assisted the entrepreneurs to leverage more and 40 million rands from our partners. Um, so far, we have assisted about 130 plus startups to commercialize and export um, some of their products. Next slide, please. Uh, so looking into our demographics, um, as Ms. Mate said, um, one of the issues in the space is that we don't have women. So our demographic really uh, proved that. Uh, so this is one of the space that we would be focusing on. As you can see, women are just 16% of the cohort that we have in Mexam all the years that we've been operational. Uh, so the first startup that um, I will go through, um, next slide, please. So the first startup that um, I will go through with uh, the example is uh, Livestock Wealth. Livestock Wealth is an agri-tech company. They created a digital platform that offers opportunity for anyone who wanted to invest in livestock. So the entrepreneur noticed a gap in the market where um, South Africans or Africans were moving more into urban areas, but they still wanted to keep their rural homes and they still wanted to farm, but they had no way of managing the livestock. So the company managed to create a platform a way they would be able to um, assist um, the potential customers and manage the livestock on their behalf with um, experts in the field. All you do is just uh, buy your, your livestock and then they manage everything on their side. Currently, the company has over 70 farmers in their portfolio with over 100 million rents invested in the company. Um, and then I'll move on to my second exam example. The, the, the second company will be M Health, um, which is known as Hear Screen. Uh, so the startup aims to uh, improve hearing, hearing screening and early detection um, services among uh, children and adults, especially on the underserved communities. So the solution was developed as an inexpensive alternative um, to other conventional screening methods that were more expensive. So it has shown to cut a uh, traditional screening cost, cost by 50 to 70%, um, and it can be administered by non-specialists. Uh, so the company has deployed um, their services over 20 countries, 
and the the the, the service operates uh, on an application on a, on, a, on a smartphone and a tablet device and it has been administered over 35,000 individuals since uh, June uh, 2017. Uh, so uh, the, the next slide, please. So the next company is Chris. Chris focuses more on using 3D printing um, to create a range of affordable um, educational robotics kits to promote an uptake on, on science and tech um, in, in primary schools. Uh, so the, the intervention is on robotics in, in invest, invention in classrooms, and it also upscales teachers because what they do is they come in and they also train teachers on robotics and how to train the, the students. Currently, it has over, the, the company has worked with over 1,500 students across South Africa, and it has also uh, been featured in different platforms um, across the world. So the last company, next slide, please. So the last company is HealthSent. Um, so the purpose of the services of this company um, was to uh, provide a platform that will reduce um, customer complaints and, and give insight to, to hospitals by providing a service for health workers um, so that they would be able to manage the resources that are available, um, such as beds and manage also um, medical aid case my, um, uh, cases and also a high bed occupants. Um, that would be um, the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Maharia. Now I would like to invite Mr. Edward Tay, CEO of Systema Asia Capital to give his presentation. Mr. Tay, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Edward I'm uh, today and a hub just a video, just a video on us. Yeah, uh, Systema Group, we are uh, Russia's largest private investment corporation. Uh, Systema is uh, actually one of the Forbes uh, 2000 companies. We are uh, established in 1993. Uh, so right now, we are also one of the main contributors to the Russian GDP, representing uh, many uh, high potential sectors. Uh, including uh, internet, uh, medicals, agriculture, and uh, also financial sectors. So uh, Systema Asia Capital, where I am the CEO, is actually a registered fund management company regulated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore and is wholly owned by the group. Next. And uh, we, we have uh, currently managing an SS, yeah, in excess about 21 billion. And uh, we have a very successful uh, investment track records uh, globally. Uh, we own uh, many listed companies, uh, many of them uh, in substantial shareholdings across the globe. Uh, we have uh, the investments in telecoms uh, that is listed in uh, New York Stock Exchange. 
Hi, sorry, Mr. Uh, Tay. Um, you are breaking up. Over a billion dollars. Uh, at least over Nasdaq was actually company. It's about fourteen billion right now. Can you I, hear me? He, uh, yes, yes. You were breaking up quite a bit, so I uh, just wanted to to let you know. Mm. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we we have uh we we have listed uh, entities in uh telecommunications and as well as e-commerce, and uh, also in uh, agriculture, uh, and uh, also real estates. And many of our companies are actually listed in the London Stock Exchange, uh, uh, Stock Exchange, uh, New York Stock Exchange, as well as the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so oops, the one before. Yeah, so, so, so just to share a bit about myself. Um, so the, myself, I have been, I've been working uh, very closely in uh, Um, hi, hi, sorry. Uh, at the sorry, time when I'm serving thousand, I have for this over. I'm sorry, there, there's quite a bit of uh, breaking up. So um, I will be turning off your video, so it will maybe help with the bandwidth. No problem. Mm. Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Please, please go ahead. It's okay. Yep. Is it better now? Ah uh, yes. Right. Okay. Yep. So uh, in my course of uh, serving in Fortune 500 companies, I have uh, many opportunities of uh, interacting with uh, fantastic companies in Africa. Uh, as early as about year 2000, uh, I have been, uh, I have an experience of working too closely with uh, NASPA, which is a big MNC uh, based out from Cape Town. Uh, that's founded as early as uh, 1915 and uh, strong uh, investments in internet publishing and also in venture capital. So um, actually I'm pretty familiar with um, um, Africa uh, in total. So what I have over here is actually uh, 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 a tech landscape about Africa itself. And Africa uh, as well as Southeast Asia has many, many commonalities itself. And South Africa and Singapore uh, has, has also many. So uh, I think just now the earliest speaker, uh, Hui Jie from Pakatili has already outlined that, uh, that both Singapore and South Africa, we are both regional representative. We are the hub in many areas. Uh, we have strong, uh, both countries, we have strong banking financials. And also there's a strong uh, skill development programs to develop all the people in areas of tech, such as internet banking, mobile solutions, data analytics. And uh, also there is a strong respect of the intellectual properties as well as a, a strong data privacy laws. For example, the POPIA and in Singapore is actually the PDPAs. And both countries is English speaking and uh, enjoyed a huge amount of uh, accessibilities uh, by linking with uh, many countries, the FDAs. So what I'd like to share uh, in the next slides is actually Southeast Asia is very much similar uh, to Africa, right? In more than one ways itself. Yep. So it's, uh, unlike, unlike uh, the African continents where we have 1.3 billion people, uh, the entire Southeast Asia have about half of them, close to about 650 million. And uh, in the 10 countries, we have approximately 500 million internet users. And if you look at the figures itself, it actually figures covers everything from online medias to travels and to e-commerce. And uh, by far in 2021, this is the fastest growing markets. Next slide. And for many of the companies who are coming over here, right, uh, from, from Africa itself, right, uh, we have to think regionals because ASEAN is not uh, monolithic portions, just very much like the African continent itself. Tech companies, need to have a large enough addressable market. So 
and they must have a high growth trajectory in order to actually to succumb the, the pressures. Next. And the digital economies in the Southeast Asia have grown about 85% year on year. As you can see that very similar to uh, South Africa, uh, the growth of the Southeast Asia have outpaced the like of even China and Brazil and India. And digital spend per person is up by 60% compared to the last years with the e-commerce sales expected to double in 2026. So right now, uh, many of the surveys have actually indicated that a lot more consumers are willing to buy online. Next. And in Southeast Asia itself, our smart cities is not really a new concept itself. There has been a strong need for public safety, communication infrastructures, and increased rates of advanced technologies. And the market growth in Apex is actually mainly attributable to the increased technology investments and the ongoing smart cities projects across the whole region. Next. Artificial intelligence, which uh, just now the earlier uh, speakers have also shared about. In South Africa, there's quite a fair bit. And in Southeast Asia as well, there is also a growth of artificial intelligence projects and also startups over here. Next. And uh, ASEAN have grown tremendously over a very short period of time. And these are the, some of the unicorns that we have seen uh, across not only just in Singapore, for example, you have uh, Travelocas, you have uh, Pukalapas from Indonesia, and you have um, those from other places as well, right? Most of them are still coming out from Singapore at the present moment, but we expect this to actually even up over a longer period of time. Next. And there are so many active uh, venture capitalists over here itself. Some of the biggest ones like the GGVs, or right, it's, uh, it's EDBIs are really all here. And we also have uh, many uh, local organizations over here. Next. And you can see that from the investment trend, the Southeast Asia's uh, venture capital investment trends is growing by leaps and bounds. Next. But this actually takes and whole ecosystems, very much like what uh, the South Africa and the Gontan province is right now doing. There has to be strong research institutions. There has to be strong accelerator and incubator. Uh, there has to be uh, supportive uh, universities and also many of the companies and as well as a strong governments to lay down the foundation for the strong IP regions and also to have a robust uh, talent pool. Next. So the, these are some of the context informations if you need to reach out to us. And in the parting words, I would just like to say that actually uh, right now, uh, given, given the amount of forest fires across the globe, given the amount of floods, and given the amount of the heat droughts, all across the globe itself, many, many peoples are actually facing a common problems. So I think, yes, this is a time where South Africa and Singapore, we can all work together to solve some of the problems in areas of sustainability, in area of uh, green economies, in area of uh, medical, so that uh, we can actually grow the economy, generate more employment, and also more importantly, leverage uh, technologies as a key enabler. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tay. So we do know that going overseas requires a lot of assistance and resources support. Other than the expert advice, experience shared by companies who have ventured into that country before, financial support could be a pivotal, uh, plays a pivotal role to provide the much needed push to venture out successfully. Hence, if you are interested to know more about grants or financial assistance programs available to be tapped into for overseas expansion, we would like to um, run a poll to find out whether you'll be interested in such um, assistance. 
So we'll just leave that on the screen for just um, a couple of seconds for you to uh, input um, your, your responses. And we, our team uh, from Global Connect will be in touch um, to speak with you and to organize uh, a conversation to find out more. Okay, uh, we will now end the poll. With that, uh, we have come to the end of today's webinar and we would like to thank all our partners for their insightful sharing and discussion on the ICT sector in Singapore and South Africa. However, the program has not yet ended. We will now like to invite our audience to take part in our virtual business roundtable session happening immediately after this. You may join us to connect with our speakers um, via uh, the QR code on the screen or the link, uh, which will be placed uh, into the chat box um, right now. So you may join us at the Zoom meeting room where you can connect with our speakers and ask some questions uh, that you may have. So we will see you there uh, very, very shortly. So you may now click the link or you can scan the QR code and we will see you there.